this meeting to order. Mayor Lee, would you lead us in the pledge? And would you call the roll, please? Yes, Mrs. Boring. Here. Mr. Gerber. Here. Mr. Tennessee Zerker. Here. Mr. Keenan. Here. Mayor Lucklider. Here. Vice Mayor Sale. Here. Mr. Reiner. Here. Thank you. <clears throat> we have a few people signed up to speak on items not uh, part of this evening's agenda. So we'll start that portion of the meeting. Uh, first up is Lori Yurko. If you'd like to come forward, please. Assuming I stand here. Okay, do I hit the green button? Hi, thank you for your time today. Um, I'm here to talk about trees and not the ones that have been falling down all over the city. <laughs> Um, Ms. Yurko, would you give yes. us your address, please? I'm sorry, 6301 Winford Drive. Thank you. Uh, my husband stood up here five years ago. Uh, we moved to Dublin in 2004. In 2005, we uh, planted some Norwegian spruce trees in our backyard along the back line. Uh, we received approval from pa Paula Chope, city treasurer. Uh, my husband went through all the processes to get approval from the city before planting. We also checked with all the neighbors. Uh, the neighbors behind us were very aware that we were planting, and once we planted them, they were about a foot and a half high at the time. Uh, they filed a formal complaint, and with zoning, they determined that it was considered a fence. Um, my husband got up here and spoke to all of you, and, and you guys decided to uh, not to make us cut down the trees. So. Here we are again, another complaint has been filed five years later. Uh, they are now complaining that it is a hedge and their major complaint is not that it is a hedge but that it is bringing in too many birds and bunnies. Um, and they feel that uh, they live behind an aviary and uh, they are, which was verbatim what was put in the letter. I uh, went to zoning, I gave them permission to come in and search our property. We've had some trees that have died so it's not a perfectly uh, set hedge. Um, so I guess a couple of reasons I'm bringing it up. One, we were told by August 1st we need to we needed to rectify the situation. Um, the code is very vague. It does say that it, it is a hedge and that we need to rectify, but there is no specific information about how far apart the trees need to be. Does there need to be space in between the trees? Do, do they need not to touch? Is it so many feet? Um, so we replied with some information for their discussion, but I guess the reason I'm here, I'm not sure um, how many times I need to come back and deal with this. Apparently I was told um, that by zoning that they don't um, enforce this unless there is a complaint. Um, so there are, I'm sure as you know, there are hundreds of people in Dublin that have trees that may constitute a hedge in the no build zone in Dublin but I guess we're doing uh, selective enforcement when it comes to asking us to take them down. So we have been asked formally to rectify it somehow. We don't know exactly what they're asking for, but I really feel like this is something, not, since we're standing here again, uh, we were told five years ago that it would go to a committee and they would talk about it and decide, and apparently that didn't quite get there. Um, so I guess I'm here asking if we could please <laughs> maybe discuss this. I know trees are a big deal in Dublin. Everybody has them. I don't think we want to say no trees. Um, and I know the code was originally put into place in the year 2000, so it might be something we want to revisit. Um, I also don't want to cut down my trees. I, you know, now they're 10 to 14 feet high. They're beautiful. Uh, all the other neighbors love them. And um, I guess it would just be sad if I had to now spend our hard-earned money and, and economic hardship to tear up trees. Uh, and the major complaint in the letter was not that they were bothered by the hedge, but that it was too many birds. Well, if I have to tear them down, I'm just going to move them. <laughs> so I'm still going to have as many trees in my yard. So um, the only other point I wanted to make, living behind a neighbor that complains a lot in the neighborhood, there have been a lot of, it, it creates a, a little bit of turmoil. Um, it's gotten to the point now where I'm uncomfortable because I feel like my neighbors are a little bit, I mean, they're very much watching out the window. They're watching our lives. They're, 
there all the time and my husband and I are a little bit uncomfortable so the trees have now provided a little bit of um, security and safety in our yard so I would hate I'm not sure now why we haven't spoken to them in five years I'm not sure why now they want an open space to our yard but it, it does make us uncomfortable as well so I just wanted to point that out and I thank you for listening Ms. Ms. Yurko, excuse me, um, I, I've had some contact with Mr. Yurko over the last week or so. Did either you or your husband contact the city today? The city? Yes. Uh, the zoning department, we had a call from Brian Walker and I today. today, and I believe he responded. My husband called him back today. Okay. And were you given or do you know, was your husband given some explanation? We were told that we could go through an appeal process, so we are now pursuing the appeal process. And apparently there's a meeting next week where we're going to learn what that process is, and we can fill out the paperwork to appeal it. But were you provided with some assurance that nothing needs to be done with the trees in the near term no. until you have a meeting? Uh, we were given till August 1st. We did ask for an extension until we could figure out the appeal process. I guess my major concern is not so much, I mean, my situation is, is primary for me, but I, I don't want to cut down my trees. But I also think other people might be in the same position. Um, well, but no, we were not given a formal extension, to my knowledge. OK. Uh, Mr. Langworthy, if you could come forward, and while Steve is coming forward, um, just for the, the rest of your benefit, um, Mr. Yurko uh, walked over to my house. You live just a block away. Yeah. Uh, a weekend ago, and shared with me an email exchange. <clears throat> excuse me, an email exchange with the neighbors. Um, and then uh, your husband came over again over the weekend. I guess it was Saturday. Excuse me, <clears throat> Sunday morning. Maybe it was. Uh, with the letter that came uh, from uh, planning, uh, you know, regarding, you know, that it was uh, determined to constitute a hedge and, you know, there needed to be some remedy. So I sent an email, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, last night, uh, I believe it was to Steve and Brian Martin, Steve Langworthy. And uh, in the meantime, you know, I asked Ann if she could pull some minutes uh, because I was had a recollection of what had transpired in 2007. I thought it was resolved. Um, and then, well, your, 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 your recollection will be refreshed when uh, Ann, uh, you know, forwards to you. They were enlightening to me. I mean, it, it, it obviously refreshed my recollection with respect to everything, you know, that had occurred, um, you know, insofar as how we were going to address this. I, I, I will say that I'm still a little confused with the status as of today with respect to our code, you know, what constitutes a hedge, what we're enforcing, and, you know, what we're not enforcing, and so forth. So, Steve? Well, without getting into a lot of the technicalities, this goes back, of course, several years uh, when this first issue was first brought forward. And at that time, there's, we have the situation where we have a no-build zone. It's not a no-disturb zone. It's a no-build zone. And, of course, we know we're not allowed to have fences in a no build zone and what was happening at the time was there was some discussion from the uh, complaining plant property owner about the plants being placed in such a situation that was to enclose the property which met if you read the code the definition of offense <coughs> at the time we looked at it and said Brian looked at it and said we didn't feel it constituted offense because it was not solid and had not grown together uh, but we did alert them at the time that at some point these plants were going to grow and they were going to grow you know close enough together uh, that at some point they could be an issue if they weren't kept trimmed well we're, we're to that point I guess this now where they have started to grow uh, begin to grow together and Brian looked uh, back into the code and determined that they are more closely aligned with a hedge rather than a fence just simply because they're expensive. Uh, that continuous row of vegetation. So we said the best way to, to eliminate the issue was to make it not be continuous anymore. And the issue we had before was this 50% opacity thing we have for fences. Well, if it's a hedge, we don't have, it's not an opacity issue anymore. It's just simply, it's not a continuous row of vegetation. So we were going to try to work with the property owners, your coast, to see if we could get a, a determination if we could just break up the continuity of it rather than trying to create a call it a fence or call it a hedge 
just create a more or less a landscape feature out of it, and that's where we, we've left it so far. Uh, Brian has been out, is out today and tomorrow, so I haven't had a chance to talk to him about the latest phone call, but that's the latest I've heard. When you say break up, because we did have a tree die, so there's a big open space, there are some that aren't even touching. How, I mean, what is the guideline for a hedge and how long? Because I don't the, know, can we wait, just trim some of the trees so there's space in between? But that, there you're absolutely right. There is no numerical computation, not like the 50% issue. There is no numer numerical consult, or, uh, computation for it. That's why Brian offered, I think, to come out to your property and work with you to see the best way. No, to I haven't I haven't received. I was told he could come and evaluate. He spoke about evaluating. Uh, and then I received a letter in the mail that said that we needed to rectify by August 1st. That's yeah, well, the only well, that, that's a letter we typically send. But I believe he, he either talked to you or your husband. I'm not sure which. But and, we, and I told him to offer to come out okay. on your property and work with you to. I guess what I'm concerned about, are we going to be doing this every year because there are a few inches in between this tree and this tree? I mean, I, I well, would love it to finalize this. It just seems like this isn't an issue for anybody else that has trees unless they have a neighbor complaining. So it, just, it seems a little odd. I, I agree. I would like to resolve yeah, that finally. If, if we could recommend that we go ahead and, I mean, I, this is the first I've heard of this, and if we can get the information and at staff level work with uh, the the resident on this issue and and resolve this and look at providing for um, an extension of time that so that the August 1st is not is not an issue if that is the concern but let us let us look into this and work with the resident I I, um, I appreciate what you're saying Marsha but I walked the property five years ago when uh, the original complaint came in and um, I, I have a couple major issues. One, I did actually think we had resolved it, so I'll be interested to refresh my memory when I see it in writing, and that there was we weren't going to require anything to be done, at not the back then or forever. I think it. Secondly, that it is really inappropriate to respond to an individual complaint about something. Um, I might decide tomorrow I don't like my neighbor, and so I'm going to find something that I can call and complain and get action against my neighbor. So I, I think it's not wise to have a system that allows that to, to activate then something. Um, and plus, the third thing I would say is five years ago we approved for them to put this in by our own staff. So five years later, six years later, 10 years or 15, it seems to me inappropriate for the city now to say, well, you know, we changed our mind or we didn't like that person's interpretation. Uh, this doesn't, I think all of that needs to be taken into consideration. But the bottom line for me is that I don't think they should have to do anything. Well, Marcia, I thought, likewise, I thought we resolved it in some way, had a committee meeting or something. And, and from my recollection, it was like, we weren't going to touch that because you look at every neighborhood and everybody has pine trees for screening. And I'm going to tell you, I know I didn't do it because I'm going like my pine trees are gone because I have a fence also. So I thought we did discuss it and we decided that there's too many uses of them being used as buffering and screening. And like Mary Lee, I thought we said, okay. And for me, if we say, okay, five years and we change our minds or something like that that should okay should be grandfathered so I'm a little confused about well and that's and, and I don't know the details of this um, so that's why I would just ask that to let us let me um, work with planning and Dana on the the issues related to this and we'll we'll keep you updated as as far as what's going on yeah. with this. well Marcia I think that's fair but uh, by the same token I do recall with what Marilee and Kathy are saying we did talk about this several years ago and I thought it was resolved and uh, we can go all through this town I mean I might have 90 foot trees in my backyard now I guess somebody could argue that's a hedge and uh, but you know what troubles me is these folks are gonna have to wait until August 1st or sometime between now and August 1st to, to hear from us on what their fate is and I just think that's uh, that's poor form and I don't think that's good management I just don't so uh, uh, I would like to see us rescind that letter. If all of you come back with some theory where we need to go forward with this, that might be something we can look at. But I just I thought this issue was, was resolved. Well, um, if, if Ann, if, if you would be so kind, Ann got 
a, I don't know, it was at least three or four sets of minutes from different meetings. And one was the community development uh, committee, which consisted of John, Amy, and I. And, and I don't know if we made a recommendation to you all, or you know, it was a, it was a meeting of the whole and so forth. But that's what you're remembering. There was pretty extensive conversation. And then I, I, I don't know whether you know, that was part of some larger review. It came up with a, uh, the community planning process Well, it, it, it was right around the time we were began talking about doing the uh, general zoning code update. Okay. And we right. had thought at the time we would fold the, the change to that part of the regulation into that update. Uh, okay. But that update didn't go forward uh, for a number of reasons. Yeah. Okay. My I, recollection I, on this was that uh, actually it added value to both property owners right? because it provides privacy so both property owners benefited and uh, since the city uh, we let them go ahead and do this in the first place that uh, we were going to let this uh, sleeping dog lie but if somebody did it with intent and violated the code then you know it, it, the code would become enforceable but I think in this case that was what the decision was and that's the way I recall it. That, that's fine with us. Our direction is fine. We, we didn't recall the end result of it from the last time, so we're happy to call it off. Yep. And, and I just talked to Steve as far as if the issue of if, if that's council's direction tonight, that's the direction that we will follow. I would, would say, because we did talk about the fact that trees are used everywhere as fences, as hedges, as privacy screening. And that was an accepted part of our community. I remember having the discussion with our law director. I think it's interesting too, and you've all been on P and Z, most of us, that we would always say, we want opacity or whatever, you know, on your mounds and whatever. And now for a homeowner, we're going like, no, we don't. I, I, I'm a little confused. I would uh, agree to like say, they had it five years ago, we're okay unless it's a menace for other reasons. But I think we would like, I would like a follow-up on this um, to see, you know, what are we doing about? Do we still have an ordinances or what's the situation? But not a follow-up on this particular property, you're saying? No, policy. in gen policy, yeah. not for this particular property, but in policy. So yeah, and that. if you would send the minutes around to all the, you know, interested staff and so forth, and then if we could have a follow-up, if we need to do some kind of code. Uh, It'd be a code amendment. Mm -hmm. Code we amendment. Need a code amendment, you know, yeah, to, that's not So that we don't have this issue again in the future. Yeah, it'll Thank have to be code amendment, because otherwise we're part of the force it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next on our list, and uh, I apologize in advance for any mispronunciation, it looks like Pedro Weisletter. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. My name is Pedro Weisletter, and my family and I live at 7934 Caraway Avenue. And the reason why I have asked uh, to speak has to do with my neighbors, Lori and Mark Lynn at 7926 Caraway Avenue. They have four dogs and uh, unfortunately they have not kept their dogs trained, period. Uh, their dogs, whenever they let them out, do what most animals would do, which is or most dogs would do, which is bark incessantly. Now, during the day, I can understand, uh, again, it's the nature of the animals. The problem is when they let the animals out at 3.30 in the morning, 11 o'clock at night, 5 in the morning. I have had the opportunity of speaking with uh, the gentleman at code enforcement regarding the noise. And I know that he has gone to their house several instances and left notices about this. Unfortunately, this is a problem that continues to occur on a regular basis. Last night, it was 11 o'clock at night where the dogs were outside and they were barking. Uh, I have contacted, in addition to the city of Dublin, the animal control and I've been told that unfortunately 
unless the animals are caught leaving the property, which they do, we, we live right in front behind of the um, uh, preserve. And so their animals go into the preserve. My understanding, I haven't witnessed that, is that the, the park ranger has also said uh, something to them. The bottom line is that my family and I are at a loss. We don't know what else to do. When we brought this issue up to our homeowners association, they sent a letter. Things get fixed for a couple of days and then they go back. Um, at some point I was told that my only recourse was to call Dublin Police Department, which embarrasses me to do. I've had to do it on a couple of instances. So I was wondering if there might be something that uh, could be done or some help that we could have in that respect. What, what was the result of your calling the Dublin Police Department? Uh, on both instances, they came and they knocked on the door and they, they brought the animals in. Okay. Did, what, I'm sorry, did you, did you contact the police or code enforcement? Both. So initially, sometime in the past, I contacted code enforcement Okay. Well, maybe I could get with you afterwards. I, sure. I, I can just tell you if, if you have a situation where the, the dogs are barking excessively, making excessive noise, that is something we can, we can deal with. Um, I don't know specifically what's happened with your case, so I'd like to talk to you more about it. Sure. Um, if they're running at large, that's a different issue, but it doesn't sound like that's the problem. So I'd be happy to discuss it with you. I appreciate it. Just, just generally speaking, though, um, Generally speaking, uh, it would be best to contact the police department in a situation like that. Uh, you know, code enforcement doesn't work 24/7, so sure. uh, we'll be at, we'll, we take calls like that all the time. And if it's a if it's a situation where um, usually we'll 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 give a warning, and if we have to go back within a you know fairly uh, short amount of time, we'll issue a citation. Okay, as I said, it. it embarrasses me to have to call the police over something like this I, I, well and like you said though the animal control that's not in their jurisdiction their jurisdiction would be if the animal is actually running at large so okay I, I would just say I don't think the embarrassment should be yours I think it should be your neighbors exactly so I appreciate what you're saying you know but um, the chief's giving you an invitation uh, you know, to contact them, so we yeah. appreciate well, it. Well, well, can, I, can I ask one question, sure. Steve? Yeah. Uh, Steve, aside from asking the government here, uh, can he also pursue uh, uh, private uh, remedies by way of? Absolutely, you could hire a private lawyer, and you have a right of privacy, and you have the right not you know to live undisturbed. Um, I think that, and we've had a lot of these instances over the years that uh, you know once the police start writing citations, we get people's attention. Yeah. Yeah. But okay. if you meet with the chief afterwards, I think he'd be okay. very helpful. Thank you, sir. But he, but he also has civil remedies. Well, you have civil remedies to also. Why not the government to, to assist? You, you, know, you have civil remedies like you do if anybody damages your home or your right of privacy, which means you could contact a lawyer, et cetera. Right. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Uh, moving on to our consent agenda, uh, does any council member wish to remove any of the 10 items listed on tonight's consent agenda for discussion during the regular agenda? Hearing no? No. Great. Uh, then I would move that we approve the actions uh, requested for the 10 items listed on the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. second. And if you call for the vote, please. Vice Mayor Saley? Yes. Mayor Lechleiter? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Yes. Mr. Gerber? Yes. Ms. Jensi Zerker? Yes. Mrs. Waring? Yes. Great. Thank you. And if there's no objection to um, moving up the fee waiver request at this point in time, we have the uh, young men in attendance. Uh, if we could jump right to that. Sure. I apologize to staff if uh, you folks were unprepared to, I don't know who's going to address this. Did Steve leave the room? Yeah, he's out in the hallway. Sorry, Steve, we moved this up. 
No, it's not the end of the meeting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'll break your own record. Huh? Yeah. Thank you. We just moved this up. Uh, okay. These are uh, two community service projects, uh, I think both done by uh, Boy Scouts, one at uh, St. Bridges at Kildare for a small 500-square-foot uh, patio uh, for use by teachers and students at um, the school, and another as at, as at the uh, Indian, uh, Party Indian Run Church at uh, St. Patrick's Episcopal Church for a 12 by 8 uh, small storage shed for garden equipment and uh, the like. And uh, they requested, they used, normally require a certificate of zoning plan approval. It, of course, has a fee attached to it. And uh, they're asking for fee waivers for these two projects. And we put them together because they're similar in nature. Great. Uh, would you young men like to come forward if you're in attendance or if there's somebody representing? There we go. I think you just scared them to death. Come on up, fellas. Why don't you tell us your name, please? Um, I'm Josh Thomas. Is there okay. any address to you? Sure, why not? Sure. Uh, 7828 Brandon Way Drive. Great. And you, sir? Uh, Nicholas Teradian, 6466 Windburn Drive. Okay. Thank you. Anything you want to say about your projects? You don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> if you prefer not to. We have it in the letter. That's good. Any questions? No. no. All right. I, I move for a waiver of the fees. Great. And if you call for the vote, please. Mayor Lechleiter? Yes. Mrs. Boring? Yes. Vice Mayor Sale? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Mr. Gerber? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Yes. Ms. Genesee Zarker? Yes. Yeah. Thanks, we have the guys. waiver. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you for your civic right. mindedness. Yeah. <laughs> thank Congratulations. You. All right. Now going back in time to second reading, ordinance 42-12. Accepting the annexation of 2.5 acres, more or less, from Washington Township to the City of Dublin. Thank you. I think this is our second reading, but thank you. That's okay. Mr. Gunnerman, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Uh, this is an uh, item that. Uh, not only have you had the first reading on, you may recall that about three months ago you dealt with the resolutions that are typical for these types of uh, expedited two annexations. Uh, this particular annexation is out off Fishel Drive. It is that wedge-shaped wedge -shaped property in the corner, and it's two and a half acres. This was some property that the city had done some negotiations with regarding a sanitary sewer easement that went along the edge of the property. Uh, but in any event, um, you did waive the uh, application fee for this as well. Uh, when those resolutions were considered, the matter was forwarded on to the county. The county has taken action. Uh, the required waiting period has passed. So you are now in a position to take action on this. This property would come into the city in the um, EAZ ID2 zoning classification uh, that uh, already applies to all the surrounding ground in the city. Great. Questions or comments? So the rest of that area is uh, township in the, in the TAN? The, the rest of the TAN area is township. It seems like the, uh, well, never mind. I, I thought we did this primarily for the purpose of running a utility. Is yeah, right? we, we had worked with this property owner for an easement to get a sanitary sewer extension out to our um, land that the city owns to comply with our job ready sites grant application. Good. Okay. All right. If there are no other questions or comments, Anne, if you call for the vote, please. Uh, sure. Vice Mayor Saleh? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Yes. Mr. Gerber? Yes. Mayor yes. Lechleiter? <coughs> yes. Uh, Mr. Reiner? Yes. Mrs. Boring? Yes. Mr. Nessie Zirk? Yes. Great, thank you. Moving on to the resolution phase of our agenda, resolution 37-12. Accepting the lowest and best bid for the Perth Wolpert Dublin Road Culvert Improvements Project and authorizing the city manager to enter into a contract for said project. Introduction, please. I'll introduce it. Thank you. Whenever you're ready, Mr. Hammersmith. Yes, sir, we're just trying to get the slide up real quick. Um, Mayor, members of council, we have before you this evening 
a bid acceptance for a uh, storm sewer culvert uh, for the Hearth Wolpert Creek or waterway beneath Dublin Road just south of Hertford Drive. Uh, the existing culvert probably dates to at least 70 to 80 years old. It's a cast in place concrete structure. Uh, and we became concerned about this structure uh, within the last couple of years based on the fact that a downstream headwall was starting to move and deteriorate. Uh, this was not previously in the CIP, but we did accelerate the design and construction of this project. Uh, the slide on the screen shows the location of the culvert. Um, if I had a pointer, uh, it's in this vicinity right here. So here's Hertford Lane, so just south on Dublin Road. And then off screen would be um, Tuttle Crossing or Tuttle Road. Um, so we designed and advertised this project for bid. Uh, the engineer's estimate was $340,000. We did receive two bids. Um, the, the lowest and best bid was from a company called Quest Group in the amount of $308,573.43. Um, this will be funded through Franklin County Permissive Tax Funds. Um, and we uh, also uh, have not previously worked with this contractor, Quest. Um, so we did do several reference checks and their references came back very favorable on comparable projects. Uh, we have worked with the project manager on this particular project. He was uh, employed by a different company previously. This will require a full closure of Dublin Road. The detour route will be Tuttle Road to France Road to Rings Road. Um, we anticipate at this point that the construction completion date by contract will be October 19th. Um, and given uh, favorable weather, we expect that to be abided by. The staff does recommend that we accept uh, the bid uh, from Quest in the amount previously stated. And with that, I'll be glad to answer any questions you might have. Questions? Yeah. <clears throat> Paul, um, just to the north, there is another culvert that goes under Dublin Road. Is that one fine? I know that we're going to have to bridge that stream as well when we um, do the bike path? Correct. Is well, that culvert fine? Yes, that actually was replaced several years ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, that's all I had. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Paul? So then is this, is this uh, feed into a ditch um, east of Dublin Road there? Yeah, there's actually quite a, a scenic waterfall. Uh, it's kind of a stilling basin just downstream or to the east of Dublin Road uh, with a pool and then a kind of nice waterfall. Uh, and it is through a rock formation as it goes out to the river. Uh, so it ultimately outlets to the Scioto River. Okay. And so then does this, I, I'm just wondering, I know where the former Hearth property was. It, does it drain a ditch far to the west? I mean, as far west as west of 270? Um, probably not that far, uh, but through this neighborhood and kind of meanders to the west. So unfortunately, I don't have a slide that shows that entire area. And I could be glad to provide that to you in a separate exhibit. But it does drain a ditch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It, it's really just, it's a natural waterway or a creek. I mean, uh, I'd probably term it more of a creek than a ditch. Yeah. Ditch kind of lends itself to thinking it's more man-made, right. uh, where the creek would be more natural. But I'm assuming it, you know, drained or traversed the, the former Hearth and Wolper Farm. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah, there is. Yeah. Okay. If there are no other questions or comments, Ian, if you call for the vote. Um, Mr. Keenan. Yes. Mr. Gerber? Yes. Mrs. Boring? Yes. Mayor Lechleiter? Yes. Vice Mayor Sale? Yes. Mr. Nancy Zerker? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Moving on to Resolution 38-12. Approving the Declaration of Mutual Support and Agreement between the City of Dublin and the Dublin Soccer League, authorizing the City Manager to execute the agreement. I'll introduce it. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Herman? Good evening. Uh, resolution 38-12 is for the renewal of the three-year agreement with the Dublin Soccer League. Uh, the agreement before you tonight has been reviewed by staff and several discussions with the Soccer League. Um, it has also been reviewed by our uh, legal department and it has also been approved by the Dublin Soccer League Board. Uh, the memo that I provided for you highlights some of the primary changes to that agreement. Um, so I think that those changes will reflect a lot of the, the new flexibility needs for the Dublin Soccer League as well as a more community focus on what it is providing for the community. So with that, um, 
staff recommends the approval of the agreement and would certainly entertain any questions you might have. And before that takes place, I'd like to introduce Mr. Um, Chris Northrup. He's the chair of the Dublin Soccer League board, and Chris has been instrumental in creating a whole new synergy for soccer in Dublin. Uh, he spent countless hours developing committees. He's gotten the community involved with some of the new activities that the Dublin Soccer League is, he is working on. And um, I think, using his own words, there's a genuine sense of excitement now in Dublin. I, I give a lot of the credit to Chris. So, Chris, if you want to say a few words, you're certainly welcome to. I'm Chris Northup. I live at 7996 Innistork Drive in Dublin. Grew up in the town, graduated from Dublin High School when there used to be only one. And uh, I do want to say it's uh, been a privilege to be part of the Dublin Soccer League and to serve as the chairman of the board of directors. And uh, it's very refreshing to have so much excitement going on in youth soccer. As you know, we're the largest cross-gender sport in Dublin. We've got over 3,500 kids playing soccer in Dublin. And uh, we've been able to enhance programming with the help of Matt, <coughs> Matt Ehrman. And uh, definitely want to thank him because for the countless hours he just recognized me working. He's been right there with me and he's been instrumental, very helpful. Marsh Grigsby's been a big part of it too. And I also want to thank the city for the work of Chris Nickel, Rob Wagner, and their teams out at our fields. Uh, we put an awful lot of strain on those fields and those boys are doing a great job out there for us. And you guys need to know that. They're doing wonderful work. Thank you. Well, Chris, I don't think we can thank you enough for doing what you're doing um, in this particular role. Um, you know, I, I, I almost want to ask, what were you thinking when you volunteered for it? But, but um, too late now. Um, <laughs> you missed a meeting. Yeah. yeah. But, but really, thank you very much. It, it's a, I don't know if it's a thankless job. And you mentioned that, um, you know, there's some excitement, you know, uh, looking forward and so forth. And, and so, uh, you know, we're, we're very grateful for people like you and your enthusiasm, enthusiasm and so forth. But um, uh, regardless of, I mean, there are obstacles you know, with any organization, but uh, this one is just so big and such a big part of our community uh, that it just requires a lot of attention and so forth. So, um, you know, I personally, and I know council joins me in the sentiment that, you know, we can't thank you enough for what you and, and your board, um, you know, are doing, uh, you know, with respect to youth soccer in Dublin. I appreciate uh, it. I appreciate that a lot, Tim, but it's, uh, it's a team sport and it's been a team effort and I'm just a, small part of that and it's been it's been a privilege to serve great. thank you great matt That's anything good. more about the agreement or uh that you would like to point out um, only if there are any questions that you might have pertaining to some of the things that i've pointed out in the memo okay questions i have a couple questions um and i you mentioned in there about um reasonable compensation on page two I had a call from someone. Is there anything in this agreement that talks about a conflict of interest or is there any interest in that? So that somebody, like the family member, or if they have formed an organization from which you are paying compensation for the services of that organization and they're sitting on the board, uh, is there anything in there that would address an issue like that? Within the bylaws of Dublin Soccer League Board, there is the ability for the board to address those concerns with the board. And if there is a need for the voting of that member off the board due to conflict of interest by vote of that board, that is in place. Okay, but would somebody, would it be obvious? Or, uh, well, you know, actually, um, in the not for profit, uh, I assume that you have this, and if you don't, you need to have it. Uh, there are conflict of interest statements that That's every board member signs. But conflict of interest doesn't mean that you don't benefit. It just means that you disclose that you are a party to such and such. Okay. So the board may be aware that Mary Lee is a member of this or an owner of such and such, or, and they may still choose to vote, and I would abstain from the vote. But it's not prohibitive, necessarily. It's a disclosure issue. Okay. And is that currently 
listed in your articles about a disclosure or anything? Like it is, actually. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good to know. Then the second thing I have, Matt, it, it has to deal with um, the composition of the teams. And we had talked about this before. And I notice in the middle tier uh, you have outlined that, not in the select tier. But on page four, number E, I found a little bit confusing. Dublin expressly reserves the right at their sole discretion to impose fees for any teams or organizations that are not composed primarily as determined by Dublin, a residents of Dublin or the Dublin School District. Um, I think that's kind of ambiguous because it could change. And that's one of the reasons that statement is generalized like that is because it's almost impossible to um, impose a specific percentage requirement because a lot of that is dependent on who actually shows up for those tryouts. Um, you may have a very small number of Dublin residents who may show, out for, uh, show up for a certain age group that does not allow for them to recruit the number of kids from Dublin to make up that percentage point. With that being said, two years ago, we imposed a non-resident fee for all players that are playing in the select leagues and at the middle tier level that they would be paying a field use fee for each season they participate in that program. Okay, so the way we've addressed the issue of what we at the time thought that there were too many outside leagues using our fields was imposing an extra fee on those? On those who were not residents of Dublin or in the school district of Dublin. Okay. Dublin schools. But on the mid middle tier you have defined the residency issue. That's correct. Okay. I will say that a lot of the efforts that Dublin Soccer League is taking today is creating an environment where the Dublin Soccer League is creating a level or multiple levels that will help with the re or the increase in those residency numbers at those club levels. And one of those is a lot of the recent discussions that I know Chris and others have had with Dublin schools and in their development of potential programming as well in the future. So we're getting a lot of um, more um, collective thought processes in our discussions with the clubs included that has not yet or hasn't been since I've been in here in, in Dublin. So we're seeing a lot of change right now that I'm, I'm promising that in the future those numbers should increase. Okay. Thank you. I have just one question. Um, could you explain a little bit about the school's uh, participation? I didn't quite understand in reading what the, how this soccer for the school participation differed from all the other sports the schools have. Um, and I'll let Chris speak to most of this, but the way that we've discussed it, um, the schools have their community education programming um, and through which they are trying to incorporate youth sports into that programming so that they are working with organizations like the Dublin Soccer League so that it's not um, so much of a Dublin Soccer League to club sport, it's more of a soccer league, kids moving up into levels that's more community based and by the, the schools offering this program, it will offer more field space potentially and keep the numbers of residents at a higher percentage rate <coughs> as they get involved with the program. What is the program? Chris, why don't you explain So that? there were, that's a great question. And there were just a few things that more or less as a dad of four kids playing soccer and every other sport that Dublin offers, but all four play soccer. There were a few things that I thought would be nice to see. Um, and being that we are very, very crowded on our fields and we put a lot of strain on them and it's a lot of work for for our city to to deal with that if we reached out to the schools and tried to make an opportunity where there wasn't one before um, so dublin soccer league has had a middle school soccer association for middle school aged kids and i wanted to enhance that Right now, we blend every kid that signs up for it. They're all welcome. They all make, make the team, they, you know. And we blend them together, and they go around, and they compete with other middle school-aged kids in other towns around Columbus. 
and it's light travel. It's very easy. Uh, it's very not competitive, but fun, uh, and still very recreational. Um, the opportunity that that I saw there was we had enough kids that we could separate the teams and name the teams by middle school mascots. So we could have a Cells Middle School Rocks team or teams. We could have a Davis Irish team. You know. And I had asked the principals if they would be open to the idea of just letting those teams play on their varsity fields in the fall, their home games. And all the principals thought it was a good idea. Uh, a couple of them were interested as to why it was something I was pursuing. And through other charitable uh, events that I participate in, I think kids at that age have a hard time finding themselves. And if they lose their identity as an athlete at that age, it's very, it's very dangerous time for a child to lose his identity or her identity as an athlete at that age. So if we could help capture into a safety net of a well-run rec program for the school, generate a little more interest, that we'd be able to potentially help children keep that identity as an athlete in our recreational programs. So that was, that was one big step forward that we're working on with the schools right now. So you would still be operating they would still come under your organization, yeah. but the location of games is what's different. That's all. Is that correct? That's all. It's different. So, how does this work for um, w one of the uh, things I became aware of several years ago was with the uh, schools that are primarily on the east side uh, that are in the Dublin School District. Many of the children that go to those schools are really Columbus residents, and so they don't actually participate in Dublin youth sports. Yeah. Um, and uh, so how do, so, it, you know, I think that there's a disconnect is the problem. So they go to our schools, but they're not competitive actually in some sports because they haven't been playing like all the other kids have been playing in the, you know, DYA and the Dublin Soccer League and all that. How do you um, work to recruit kids that are in the district but living outside of the corporate limits? That's, again, a, a good point. And I'd like to bring up <clears throat> Dublin Soccer League's primary method of recruiting has been attraction rather than promotion. Um, so it's word of mouth and it's people talking about their kids having a, having a good time in our program. Uh, but we don't do a lot of advertising at all and, and uh, maybe a little bit, but not much and we don't have much budgeted for it. Um, it has been traditionally more of an attraction rather than promotion principle that's driven the soccer league. Um, and we noticed the same thing you noticed and quite frankly we didn't know if it's a good idea to try to recruiting kids that are, you know, maybe not wanting to play soccer. Um, so really, if, if a child is expressing interest in it and just trying to educate the community as to what's out there, the one thing I, I would really enjoy the schools helping us with is uh, letting kids in the schools pre-register, like a football team. They had football meetings at the schools several weeks ago before school let out. If you were interested in joining the football team, you went to one of these meetings and you talked about the team. They told you what to expect and you knew when to show up for practice. If there's a way that the schools can help us to have a meeting like that for soccer and educate people about what's going on, um, I think that would be helpful. Oh, that would be great. Yeah, I think that would be great. We'll see if the schools let us do that. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Any other questions, comments? Great. Well, thanks to both of you. Uh, Ann, if you would call for the vote, please. Mr. Gerber? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Vice Mayor Saleh? Yes. Mrs. Boring? Yes. Mayor Lechleiter? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Yes. Uh, Mr. Nessie, sir? Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay. Look for staff comments, Marcia. Uh, just some quick updates on the, the uh, storm event that we had Friday evening and where we are uh, with regard to some of the issues related from that. Um, I think we've sent out information. We have information out on our website and tried to get the word out that the rec center is open and available for residents who are without power that if they want to use the facility to charge their electronic devices and also there may be some areas where the residents without power are also on wells and they may want to use the facilities for showering. Um, we had also put up and previously each year we do uh, fogging in the area of Kaufman High School and because of the fact that the power is out in that area and people have windows open we're not going to fog but we'll do some of the non-airborne spraying uh, so that won't happen. Uh, we've had recent updates from AEP and we have uh, currently 2,268 outages for AEP. That went up a little bit as a result of the storm that we had last night. Uh, Union Rural Electric, which provides service to a portion of Tartan West, they have no outages. And Ohio Edison, which serves the western part of the city, they currently only have three outages. So. Um, you know, we'll continue to get updates from AEP uh, with regard to the outages that, that we have through them. Um, as far as the removal, we had the, uh, the streets cleared and were all passable by f Saturday evening. Uh, there were a lot of trees and limbs down. It was pretty amazing how many that did come down. So the staff did a great job of getting out and getting the, the roadways cleared. We had issues with traffic signals. Uh, fortunately, we have backup and we have generators that provide backup for those. Um, right now, all the signals are operational. There are two that still remain um, on backup power until power is restored. We have had several of the street lamps in the historic district that were destroyed and several that were damaged, so we'll start working on replacement of those. Uh, we do have funds programmed for next year for replacement of the type of lamp posts. so what we're looking to do is those that we're replacing will be replaced with the new so you'll see some differences with the lamp post for a while. Uh, road closures, there had been two up until late this afternoon as a result of um, electric lines that were down. Uh, Martin Road, that line has been taken care of with re as far as getting it out of the way. They still have power issues, but Martin Road is open now. The only street that is closed is Franklin Street, and it's, but it is open from Bridge Street to the Town, town Center 2 parking lot. Uh, recreational programming has continued. We've done some rescheduling uh, from the Wyandot camp. The North Pool remains closed until we get power back from AEP. The South Pool is open. We did have some damage to uh, the rec center roof that has been replaced. We have other minor damage for structures throughout the city. The Kaufman House, we were just in the process of completing the roof replacement and they were almost finished Friday afternoon. So they had to go back and do some additional work there, but I think that's been taken care of. Uh, we do have one bike path that will be closed and it's up here uh, back off of um, Kaufman Road. We call, called it the, the, start, the old Starkey property and it's the connection to uh, Coventry Woods and, and the Woods of Indian Run. So we'll have signage up and that relates to trees on personal property. Um, and some of the concerns or dangers uh, on the bike path. So that'll be closed and signed. Um, public safety issues, we've provided information on the website about if people do need to leave their homes or are planning to leave their homes because of power to call us for vacation watch and we will provide additional um, service there and also to warn residents of contractor fraud and issues that occur when things like this happen. Also, Friday night, the police department reported uh, over 850 calls the first four hours of the storm. And the one thing to note, the city of Westerville had some issues with um, their phone system, and our police department and our dispatchers were able to provide assistance to them uh, with calls that they were getting until they were able to get back up and running. Volunteers, we had, we've had many calls from people who want to help. Um, yesterday, there were a group of about 25 volunteers that did a lot of work out here in Kaufman Park. Kaufman Park was pretty was hit pretty hard. We had a lot of trees down and, and damaged, so they spent several hours yesterday afternoon doing a really nice job of cleaning up the park. Um, we have a storm recovery webpage that's been set up. 
uh, and would encourage people to continue to go there to look for updates. And as of um, either early this morning or late last night, we've had over 2,200 hits or people who have uh, looked at that website. So I think we're making pretty good progress and we still have some work to do. As far as debris pickup, we've been focusing on um, the stadium site and making sure everything is ready for the 4th of July, the parade route so that everything is ready and okay for the parade route. Starting Thursday, we'll do uh, debris pickup in the neighborhoods and we're going to use a zone process and we'll have uh, pickups in every zone um, every week. We think we can get through the city one time in three to four weeks and then we'll do it again because typically what happens is once people get things cleaned up and out to the curb and we pick up, they'll go back out and clean up some more and put additional stuff. So we think it'll probably take us anywhere from six to eight weeks to get all the debris picked up, which is similar to what it took us when Ike came through back in 08. Um, so I think that's all the updates on the, uh, the storm event. Just to say that, um, you know, I really appreciate all the work that staff put in over the weekend and the quick reaction. And, um, you know, it's nice to know that when these things happen, we've got a lot of people that know what they're doing and they get out there and just take care of their business. Marcia, may I ask for some clarification? Today was the yard pickup normal day and they were going around for the yard pickup and the trash bags. So when shall, should people think about putting those out again? To put, put out for the, the typical yard waste pickup? Well, a lot of people are putting their sticks in those. Yeah. Know. Well, we're, if they want to put out for us the chipper service to just do what they typically do and, and take the, uh, the debris out to the curb and we'll pick those up, they don't have to bag those. And the longer the, the limb is, the better and easier for us to handle. If you're putting something in for your mon regular Monday pickup, things need to be bundled in um, gr sections that are no longer than, I think, it's four feet. And we all are also, since you mentioned that, we are looking at, and uh, we'll be talking with Rumpke with regard to regular trash pickup. Um, one of the things we found that last time during, after I came through the, the hurricane, um, is that because of power being out, a lot of people had um, additional food waste to throw away. So we'll be contacting them, and if we need additional pickups, we'll coordinate with Rumpke on that as well. One thing I noticed, the city of Worthington put a dumpster at some place for people to bring their um, additional food waste, a central collection point, so they didn't have to, you know, to charge okay. their folks. So that might be an idea. Okay. We'll check in on that. And we think that we can accomplish particularly the, the debris pickup with our existing resources and manpower? Um, yes, but we are, we are looking at um, the potential for getting contractors. Uh, the other thing that we are looking at, there's been a uh, disaster declared by the governor as well as Franklin County. And so we're doing some additional follow-up to see if we can get reimbursement for damages and additional costs that we incur for debris pickup and different things. But we are looking at the possibility if we get out there and see that there's more out there than we think there is, that we'll um, look for some outside assistance either through a contractor or if it's just a need for additional equipment that another community that wasn't hit has something available, we'll work with them through our uh, mutual aid agreements. And is the rec center available for those that are still without power to escape the heat of the day? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right, they don't necessarily have to be members to, no, to go no. there. Okay. No, we're encouraging people. And we also have some of the volunteers. They, they are working with our um, employees in the, in the senior area of the, the rec center. Um, some of the programs or systems that they have set up to call and check on people. Um, so, and, they're, and they're being told that they can come into the rec center if they need to as a cooling site. Okay, all right. Other questions or comments? All right, thank you very much. Um, and we're, we're on track for July 4th, there's power to the stadium? Yes, yes, things are still on, on schedule and okay to go. Okay, good. Marilee, you wanna lead off round table? Um, I, thank you, yes, I wanted to um, ask a couple questions on some of the memos that were in the uh, packet. Um, first on the DCVB bid for football universities Top Gun camp. 
and I not noted that uh, staff had attended their meetings um, and um, committed uh, 15 to $25,000 of grant with um, uh, that they'd be coming forward requesting council's approval of that. Um, which led me to think of a couple things um, that I'd like to um, think through maybe the finance committee agenda or something. I'm not sure which committee is the right one to do this, but um, it seems like the um, Bureau, which is doing a, a terrific job at um, bringing in uh, different uh, types of activities to fill the beds, uh, it is in need of uh, financial commitments from the city in order to uh, be competitive in the bidding process for a number of things that they're doing. Um, and uh, currently, the way the process seems to be working is that um, staff is making uh, those commitments and we get it at the end of the process for a final approval. But we were not really in a position at that point to say no, really, because the process has gone on for some period of time. So um, I was chatting with uh, Kathy earlier today and uh, I wondered if one alternative to this is for us to consider setting aside some sum of bed tax money that would be available for the Bureau to consider as they're putting together these packages that require something like this. It would let us know that, that we've committed potentially up to some amount. Second, it would make the, the Bureau have to think through, you know, how many of these uh, types of agreements they would go for or what amount of money. I mean, if you come every time, then at the end we might have spent $100,000 that year for their potential bidding. I realize it's never spent unless they actually get awarded it. But fortunately for us and them, they're, uh, you know, they're successful in this process often. Uh, so I don't know which venue it would be good to have the discussion, but I'm thinking that I'm not, I'm not satisfied, I'm uncomfortable with the way the process is currently working because of council coming in at the end of the process. Yeah, and typically we haven't had very many instances where um, they were bringing in the big events that they need assistance. I think the last time this happened was with the Can-Am Games, and that was something that they knew about, um, gosh, at least a year in advance and had to work through that process. This is an event that um, until mid-June we didn't think it was going to be able to move forward because of the cost that was going to be incurred by the, the event sponsor to come here. So this was one our intention was to get this to council previous to um, them committing to file for the application. Uh, the cost, the schools came back um, sometime early to mid-June making a significant reduction in their cost to use the fields and then the Bureau increased their allocation from the 15000 to the 25000 So this is one where um, what we had intended when we first started having conversations with them is that we would bring this to council ahead of time, but it ended up the time the time ran out basically. Uh, so we can look at different options. It is it is something that doesn't happen very frequently, and the bureau has done a good job of um, working with us and starting to have good conversations on these type of events to to bring in. But we can look at different options um, to do this. But it, it is not, it, it isn't something that happens um, very often. Right, but I, I think it's uh, perhaps a new wave of the way you negotiate and market and uh, just put a, together a packet. You know, Marilee, we were talking at the Finance Committee earlier this year about some of these bed tax grants and that, you know, it, I, somebody I think raised the issue of does it make sense to uh, open uh, our committee for uh, review of other applications throughout the year, except, except you know, in a, <laughs> can't even talk to that. I'm sorry. Uh, except for just once a year, can we do it more often? And this might 
beg for that process. Uh, I'm not willing to give a blank check to somebody without knowing what it's about, but, uh, but I recognize that I think there's going to be uh, situations like this that could happen more frequently in the future, and if that's the case, then maybe the, if it is the Finance Committee, it should be uh, maybe amenable to uh, hearing these applications on a more frequent basis. Well, I, I certainly would agree to that as well. It doesn't need to be open to the public more than once a year. Yeah. Um, we used to do them twice a year, mm -hmm. but then yeah. we found that uh, for their planning purposes, because of what most of them were coming for, right. they really needed it in the fall uh, as they built their budget and their event. Uh, but certainly uh, uh, something like this, the Convention Bureau could ask for a special finance meeting. But again, it needs to be early in the mm -hmm. process that council is brought into the discussion and not forced into a commitment because that was the understanding of the organization prior to coming to us. Um, so I, I just think we need to think through mm -hmm. that. Um, the other uh, memo we got here is on the possible creation of the CED um, district for the uh, Bri High, uh, Bridge, Bridge Street Corridor area. And it, maybe I misunderstood the way I read it. At the end, it sounded like we weren't actually moving forward yet with processing for this. And I guess I was wondering, if, if I read that right, why would we not now move forward when I think that we, I guess, I, I know we, we had some conversations along the way that this would certainly be essential uh, to the development of that area. Yeah, and, and we did talk about the timing of doing this, and, and it is something that what we've learned, it's, it's a relatively simple process and can be quick. Um, we wanted to provide information to council and, and some background on um, how these things work. And there are also, we're having some conversations that there are some policy issues that probably need to be brought to council and also looking at what makes sense as far as the number of districts and where they might go or how they may be set up. So those are some of the things that we're still looking at and we'll be bringing back to council, but we wanted to give you this update um, so that you knew that we were moving forward on this. And the, my final question had to do with the memo of the updates on the government affairs. And um, I, I, along with other council member did attend, members, did attend that Memorial Tournament Government Affairs Day. Um, it seemed not to be as, um, significantly attended this year as it had been the year before. Uh, there were no representatives from Columbus, the city of Columbus. And I'm wondering um, if, if we might have, it, not tonight, but be engaged in some kind of conversation about what we are trying to achieve, both the city and council, in that kind of a venue, and how we might ensure that the people get there, because they're there seemed to be less businesses there as well. And um, the year before, it had been extremely well uh, attended by elected people as well as uh, uh, some of the major co companies. We can provide that update. Thank you. Great, thanks. John, as you might have guessed, we started a round table. Uh, I just want to say um, I'm glad that the uh, staff had a successful meeting with ODOT about the Glick Road, and I, I don't want to hold up the meeting, but I do want to find the details out later on uh, what actually happened and where we're going to go with that. And then the other comment I had was uh, on the CNG uh, um, gas station with gas for $1.99. You know, it's, it's, you know what's exciting about that meeting, and I don't know if I think everybody may have realized it, I'm not sure, is that this is sort of a dawn of a new age for America, really. Uh, energy independence. 100 year supply of uh, natural gas. It was a um, huge impact on our Middle East policy and what we'll be doing in the next 50 to 100 years. So um, I was very proud of the city for being the first subs or suburban um, city to have a CNG gas station. So I just hope the rest of the country follows the lead of Dublin and uh, starts developing this fantastic resource because it's going to liberate our country and it's going to provide a really secure energy for our kids in the future so it's really a worthwhile event thank you thanks john kathy yeah, one thing i want to 
they asked and Amy, you may be bringing this up, is when we are going to schedule an evaluation for our city manager. Have we set a date for that? Should we start working on that? And what would that discussion be? Um. Marsh and I have very prelimin pre preliminarily discussed the fact that we need to do it. And um, I think earlier this year I brought up that we owe her an evaluation. And, um, you know, as, as with most other things, it, it just sort of time gets away from us. So you are correct, Kathy. And uh, I will work to get a report back to council by the next meeting, beginning of August. Is that okay? Okay. Okay. So right now at this point, our first step is asking for her self-evaluation, the PSE or whatever. Well, what we need to do is decide what sort of um, process we're going to use because we have in the past done, oursel done it ourselves and then I think we found a lot of success with a facilitated performance evaluation. Mm -hmm. And then within that facilitated performance evaluation, we can, you know, um, decide, you know, how how that looks. Because some managers want a 360 evaluation, some managers you know, need to do their own. And that was what I wanted to discuss with Marsha. And well, at some point, is the administrative committee going to meet, or is the council going to meet to, at, you know, determine what how we want to conduct it? Well, I think that um, what I was looking for was some ideas from our manager and then convene, you know, the, the administrative committee of the whole and whoever wants to be involved in the process of select, you know, deciding how we want to proceed. But you're correct, we do need to do it. It's the okay. bottom line. Um, I've been, maybe I'm naive, I hope not, but I was so impressed with the way our staff responded to this storm. Uh, we happened to be coming up Riverside Drive and not only did you put the major intersections on that part of town where I was um, on the generator so there was no confusion, but you also went out and wrecked the physical stop signs at the key places on Riverside Drive. And I looked on my email once and there were all these constant actions that you were taking. And I just thought, I don't believe there's another community that has the staff that would put that much effort that continually for this and I just want to say congratulations to you and the staff and and thanks for the effort uh, it made me feel safe if nothing else and very proud of how when people drive through they're going to notice thank you we'll pass the word along thank you thanks Kathy Mike just briefly the um, we attended the CNG dedication there and that was quite well attended and I know others will address it but I was glad we made the effort in spite of the nearly 100 degree temperatures. Mm -hmm. um, it was quite a, quite a turnout from the entire area, so that was well done. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Rick? Very quickly, our subcommittee on KIA recognition met uh, last Thursday. Uh, as you know, the subcommittee consists of Mike, John, and myself. Uh, it was our first meeting, so uh, the very purpose was just sort of to uh, throw out a few ideas out on the table, and, and then from there that generated uh, some uh, more talk about asking staff, Fred and uh, Sarah, to get more information for us. Uh, that's all we have this time. We're going to meet again September 6th, and at that point we can start putting together a recommendation. So I'm hoping maybe sometime in October, realistically, we'll have a recommendation with numbers, et cetera, to present to all of council. Great. Thank you. Amy? I have lost track. This is the one thing about having an iPad that's wonderful and awful. Um, I have lost track of my, okay. <clears throat> Why don't you go ahead, Tim, and I will find my note. Okay. I'm sorry. Well, I just uh, echo the sentiments of uh, council members uh, with respect to staff's reaction to the storm. Uh, everybody, you know, whether it be the police department and maintenance or, uh, you know, the, city, the, the streets crews and, and uh, recreation center and so forth. So, um, you know, uh, our gratitude and thanks for everything that they've been doing. Um, 
probably noticed uh, that there was an article, I believe it was in yesterday's paper, uh, with respect to, uh, I hate this description, the anti-poaching agreement. Um, and uh, the uh, City of Columbus staff's um, comments, which I found interesting. But um, maybe I should just leave it at that. But um, what, what I'd like, um, if council is in agreement, and, and I had some limited conversation to this effect uh, with, I don't remember exactly who, I don't know whether, don't recall whether it was Marsha or Dana or whomever, but uh, I thought it would be interesting to see uh, some statistics with respect to employment. Uh, we know our numbers in Dublin, but in the aggregate, the numbers, the employment numbers of all the, what, 15 or 16 suburbs uh, comprising Central Ohio, what their numbers are relative to the city of Columbus, for example. And I, I'm not, it, it's not for the, um, uh, with the intention of being adversarial, but just to get some perspective. Um, and, and if, you know, we could, we could get those numbers. Um, and then Mary Lee had suggested, I, I don't recall whether it was in conversation or whether it was um, during roundtable perhaps, uh, but that years ago, Many of us will remember a meeting that we had at the McCoy Center, I believe, in Hilliard. Uh, and, you know, maybe we, uh, we, meaning Dublin City Council, you know, should take the lead, uh, you know, in bringing the suburbs together just to, you know, have a conversation. Uh, you know, I, I do agree um, with uh, some of the comments in the article attributed to the City of Columbus officials. Um, you know, with respect to what the suburbs are doing and, um, you know, in many cases, uh, you know, abiding by the spirit of, you know, what was intended, you know, with respect to this larger agreement and so forth. But uh, I, I don't know what council's feelings are. Marcia, you seem to want to say something. Well, we, I have had, um, you did mention to me about the employment figures and I've had some follow-up conversations with Steve Campbell, who is the, um, the uh, individual from the city of Columbus that has kind of been facilitating the, the process or trying to coordinate getting information and also the fact that we'd had the conversation when we discussed the issue about having um, elected officials get together and so it was something that was he said that they would be fine with looking into that they're trying to get through the first round of reviews by all the different communities to figure out um, where they are with regard to the status of all the different communities. So I will follow up with Steve again to see um, the inf if he's been able to get any of that information or what some of the time frames may be on getting information as well as uh, coordinating and getting some meetings set up. I mean, I guess I'd like for us to be in a position to um, respond because it, it, it's appearing to me as though the media anyway is, is um, inclined to target Dublin, you know, as being the reason, you know, for the other suburbs who, as far as I know, we don't have any control over, you know, making independent decisions, uh, you know, to not enter into this agreement. That being said, you know, it seems to me that, uh, you know, maybe this is an opportunity for us to take a, a leadership position uh, and, and be a little bit more proactive. Uh, I recall, I think there was an editorial in the Columbus Dispatch uh, uh, maybe it was the Monday following the Memorial Tournament, and you know there was no acknowledgement that the tournament was held in Dublin, and y you know to those of us you know that um, I think are a little more aware, you know I have no reason to believe that that was not wholly intentional, um, and you know I don't know that we would have any influence over what uh, is written in an editorial uh, in in the Columbus Dispatch. Uh, you know, but the city of Columbus, you know, I, I, I think that there needs to be, in my view, you know, some recognition uh, and the Columbus partnership, there needs to be some recognition of the value of the individual suburbs, uh, you know, the decades long effort, uh, you know, that we, all of us have put in to establishing our respective identities and uh, what we contribute to the fabric of Central Ohio. And, you know, I, I think that can be a positive thing, and I think that can work to the benefit of all of us. So, anyway, that's my speech. I'm in agreement with you that I'd like us to um, 
take the leadership role in setting up a meeting with our elected officials was what we were interested in having a conversation with. Um, and I thought the article uh, that you referred to, about the most recent one, um, you know, I guess maybe I was reading it this way, but I, I do think that it demonstrated that there was hesitancy, not just by Dublin, but by other communities. Um, and I, I think it goes back to that I, I think we all have the same goal. We all want to develop a thriving region here. And we all know that the central city, uh, it's essential that we have a strong a central city in addition to a strong region uh, made up of suburban communities and, and other counties as well. Um, but we, only have, we all have the same tools available to us. And the companies know we have the same tools available to us. So um, it's not that uh, we're attempting to take somebody else's workforce from them in order to gain uh, whatever the taxation is in your own community. It's just that we're not going to, we, we have a, a responsibility to respond to those that come to us and ask us questions, and then we only have these tools available to us to use. And we elect to use certain ones of those tools, just like other communities elect to use other ones. And I don't, I, I don't see what the problem is with that. But I also know that we haven't had formal conversations with our counterparts in these communities. And I, that's the meeting that I am interested in um, having, you know, facilitated uh, by Dublin. You know, and probably even have it in our rec center. Remember, we had one, the following mm -hmm. one actually was in the rec center that we um, organized. I think that's a great idea. Mm -hmm maybe help to find the discussion rather than us speaking with one another through the media you know because it, it's a lot easier when you you know know who you're t know who you're calling and I was thinking of Columbus's case I don't know that anyone is still on their council that was at that meeting in 2002 no there isn't um, I think Mayor Coleman is the only person that's still mm -hmm. with Columbus and to the point that you raised earlier Mary Lee, I mean there was nobody from Columbus no. at, at the villa you know, during the tournament, which, uh, you know, it would have been nice to, you know, have that opportunity for interaction. So, anyway, Amy? I found my notes, thank you. Um, Marilee asked a couple of the questions that I had um, about the follow-up memos. One, I wanted to bring to Council's attention, though, that August 15th is the date for our dinner with the Planning Commission. Um, I think we're meeting out at the Golf Club of Dublin, and we're working um, with planning to get, um, a couple agenda items that we can hopefully have a discussion about and um, basically just sit down in the same room and, and get to know one another and um, Reno I should say and then also um, disappointed that we couldn't talk about the um, Arts Council agreement a week ago but that is another meeting that's going to need to get scheduled so I'm assuming John you're going to have Ann pull us and we'll figure out some one, the one day we're not actually meeting we'll have a meeting in August and um, just want to echo everybody's comments about um, the storm response. Um, it, you know, made me really, really proud of our staff. Um, you know, when I got calls and, and, you know, heard about things that were happening in the city, it was all complimentary. And that's, that's, that's huge after an event like that. So thank you very much to everybody for that. That's all I have. Thanks. Okay. John, did you have anything else? No, I just agree with you, Mayor. I mean, Dublin is the, uh, on the issue of, uh, probably hosting a meeting. We're the second biggest economy in the region. And we've always been the leaders in progressive ideas and progressive legislation and uh, you know, everything else down the line. So I think uh, it'd be beneficial for us all to get together and try to come up with a resolution of this issue. It's not that we were dead against it. I mean, the concept was right not to poach each other's people. And we certainly haven't, and we certainly have unfortunately suffered from this by other communities, but you know, there's value in the concept, and uh, I think that we can hash this out together and get this issue resolved. So, great. Well, thank you very much, um, and uh, wish everybody a happy Fourth of July. Uh, look forward to seeing you all on Wednesday. Was there anything else? Okay. We'll uh, cross our fingers for good weather. Thank you. We're adjourned.